very good. We have all our uh, panelists uh, already here. We've got um, Dr. Dalil, Junaid, uh, Pollen, and all the colleagues uh, that need to be with us. And Dina has just joined. So, Hugh, Hugh, I think we're going live now. Very good. Thanks, Hello, everyone. Yeah. Very good. So, let me, um, on behalf of the Health, Nutrition, and Population uh, Global Practice in the Human Development Practice Group, welcome all of you to this report launch on Walking the Talk Reimagining Primary Healthcare in the post COVID uh, era. While we're still in the pandemic, uh, we feel this is a very timely uh, moment to kick off the discussions on how we can reimagine primary health care. While we knew that the universal health coverage agenda prior to the COVID-19 pandemic was making steady progress in terms of increasing access, we also knew that the rate of increase in access was not sufficient for many countries to reach the UHC 2030 goals. While quality of care was mixed, financial protection in particular was heading in the wrong direction by 2019. COVID-19 has only exacerbated those concerns that we had as a global community in terms of helping countries think about how to reach the goals of universal health coverage by 2030. We've seen the disruptions in health services. We've seen the disruption to economies, putting pressures on fiscal space to finance healthcare, as well as other essential services. All this make the case for doubling our efforts and reimagining what we're doing in terms of organizing the delivery of health services in many countries. So this report is a contribution that is shining light hopefully laying an agenda that can be on our path to improving the pace of progress in improving access to quality health services and also financial protection and sustainability of health systems globally. So without much further ado, we have an excellent uh, set of speakers for this event. And I would like to introduce them as they come to speak. First, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mamta Murthy, who is uh, Vice President for Human Development at the World Bank, to give us her opening remarks. Uh, Mamta, uh, over to you for your opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Mohammed, and and uh, and hello to colleagues and and friends and and listeners uh, at this event. I'm I'm really delighted to be here um, uh, with you for the launch of this very important flagship report. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, since the advent of this pandemic, uh, health systems the world over have been under the spotlight as countries have, have tried to respond uh, to, this, to this devastating pandemic. The pandemic has not only be, uh, is not only a health crisis, it's an education crisis, it's an economic crisis, it's a social crisis, and it's a financial crisis. Uh, indeed, what it has shown is that different parts of the economy are, are so closely interlinked with the performance of the health system. That's why uh, in, in response, uh, the World Bank has launched its largest ever crisis response in history. Uh, and as a part of that, uh, largest ever and fastest ever crisis response in history. And as a part of that, uh, we have committed over $125 billion in the past 15 months. Uh, to support countries as they respond in health terms, in, in economic terms, and in social terms uh, to the crisis. Um, as a part of that 125 billion, we initially provided $6 billion for emergency health response, of which 4 billion are disbursed. We also provided an envelope of $12 billion to, to focus on on uh, um, vaccines, but also therapeutics uh, and diagnostics. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to say that $4 billion of this has been committed in, in over 40 countries um, as, of, uh, as of today. Now, in all of this, we know that, that um, primary healthcare is, is often the weakest link in the response to the crisis. And, and um, without 
a, a well-performing primary healthcare system, it is very difficult for countries to actually flatten the curve of the pandemic. Whether it's, uh, whether it's surveillance activities, whether it's testing and contact tracing, um, whether it's uh, promoting uh, hand washing, or, or whether it's, it's providing the, the kind of immediate response that can, that can prevent uh, saturation uh, of the hospital system. Um, that's why in, in our emergency response activities, um, in virtually every emergency response activity we have supported, we have emphasized the strengthening of, of the uh, primary healthcare system and um, strengthening community health activities including support for community health workers and, and engagement um, uh, of communities in, in response uh, to the pandemic. We've also supported uh, essential preventive care, um, uh, reproductive health services um, that, that have been uh, unfortunately lagging and, and, and other very important, um, very important health response measures. That's why the launch of this report today is, is so important. Um, it, 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 it's extremely important for responding to the pandemic and, and bringing uh, it under control. But it's also important because this is a moment when one can think about transforming um, the entire health system through a transformed and reimagined primary healthcare system. This is uh, essential if if uh, countries are to achieve the health SDGs and, and provide um, universal health coverage. And it's also essential if, um, if the bank is to support its own uh, twin goals of, of reducing poverty uh, and, and promoting uh, shared prosperity. Now, um, this report is, is, is coming at a, at, at a very important moment when, when countries are trying to put the pandemic behind them and also as they are preparing for, for building stronger health systems uh, going forward. And in, in this report, we have tried to distill the, the decades of experience that we have working with partners in supporting primary healthcare. And we've also tried to distill the lessons uh, from the COVID response. In putting out this report, we are focusing not just on the what, what needs to be done, but very importantly on the how, how things should be done. What are the changes, the transformations that, that countries have to make in order to have a fit for purpose primary healthcare system that underpins a very strong healthcare system that can provide services, qual high quality services to all, and also help countries be better prepared for, for the next pandemic. We know that, that these, um, this reimagined primary healthcare system uh, will, will not come for free, it will come at a cost, but we uh, strongly believe, and as we show in the report, uh, these costs are paid over, paid back many times over because, because of the prevention uh, that um, uh, is a part of a strengthened primary healthcare system. We also show that a strong primary healthcare system is essential for resilience uh, if, if countries have to be ready and better prepared and respond to, to the next pandemic. So with that, uh, let me say no more than, than, than to say that I'm really excited that we can launch this report at this moment. And I really look forward to the comments uh, uh, and, and suggestions uh, from from all the from all the participants at this event, and um, because we are just uh, we have the summer holidays ahead of us, I'd like to say that I actually think this report will make excellent summertime reading. And I hope that in addition to listening to to all the presenters and the commenters today, uh, people will go away and read this report over the summer because it it provides uh, incredible illumination. And, and food for thought on how we can do things better going forward. So with that, uh, let me hand it back to you, Mohammed, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Mamta, for those uh, great opening remarks. I'll uh, ask then uh, Fang Zhao, the Practice Manager for the Health, Nutrition, and Population uh, Global Engagement Unit, to uh, kick off with presentation 
of the uh, flagship report itself. Fang, over to you. You're muted, unmute yourself. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so we have uh, three members of the uh, the flagship report uh, team will present uh, the highlight of the report. You already have the report, but we just want to quickly go through some key messages and highlight. So we have Ennis um, will um, walk through us the background, the rationale, and the framework. And then Hui Hui will touch on the whole part and uh, the policy reforms need to be taking place. And then I will come in at the end to talk about some uh, forward-looking messages. So um, this is the arrangement. So now I'll invite Ennis to come first. Thank you, thank you very much, Fong, and thank you, Mohammed, and thank you, Mamta, for this great opening remarks. Uh, let's stay on this first slide for a moment because I will set the context by basically using the three set of uh, operative words on the title here. First, we are referring to reimagining primary healthcare. I think those of us who have worked on primary healthcare for many years know that talk about primary healthcare started in late 1960s. Actually, this was a term coined by Christian Medical Commission in late 60s, which has then taken over by the WHO in early 70s, leading to the declaration of Almaty in 1978. At that time, in 1960s, there were about 3 billion people on earth and two thirds of them living in rural areas. So the focus on primary care at that time was very much about how to bring health care to local communities living in rural areas. Yet by 2030, which is the deadline for the strategic uh, uh, sustainable development goals, sorry, there will be about 8 billion people, 5 billion of whom will be living in urban areas. So the demographics have changed, the epidemiology has changed as well. Now about 70-75% of all deaths are related to non-communicable diseases, which was not the case in 1960s, where we had a lot of uh, infectious diseases that were very incident and prevalent at that time. And in those days, there were very few healthcare workers. Actually, doctors are, were very sparse, especially in low and low middle income countries. We were talking about having one doctor for every 30, 40,000 people or so. And now we know that, for example, WHO thinks that it makes sense and it's feasible and attainable to have 4.5 healthcare workers for every 1,000 population. We are not there yet, but I think if you look at the projections, we may be getting there by 2030 or 40 or so. So that is the first thing, why we have to call it reimagining. Second, we need to make the PSC fit for purpose. A PSC platform and services in an urban, urbanized shanty town would need to be very, very different from the ones in a remote village where you will have the community health workers plowing the train to reach the unpaneled community. One size fitting all with some unmodifiable norms will not do it. We used to have a lot of norms for primary health care. We have to be, we had to go beyond the norms. We tried with the norms and we know that it didn't work. And the third point, and perhaps more importantly, is that the reimagined primary health care will need to walk the talk. And that is the title of the report. We have gone through several iterations in defining it, redefining it, conceptualizing it, broadening it, uh, reducing the, uh, the scope, etc. But I think it is time, it's high time for us to put aside all of that and focus on delivery, on the what and on the how. This is all the more important, as you know, we are going through a pandemic and you know that uh, if we had high performing primary healthcare systems, a delivery method, we would not be talking about the flattening the curve as Mamta Abdi mentioned. Next slide, please. So in, in this presentation, this is the outline. We have four sections. I will very briefly talk about the time to deliver and reimagining primary healthcare. Then my colleague we want will be getting into the what and how and then after that, uh, Fang, as he said, he will be giving us the recommendations for the countries, for our donor partners, and for the World Bank itself. Next slide, please. Yeah. While we may have some discussions still, 
uh, we do hope that our report will put to an end to it about what primary health care is and is not. But I think there is one thing that everyone agrees on, is that the primary health care is essential service pl platform for achieving universal health coverage. And where primary care and essential public health services merge, where people and communities are empowered to express their health and health care needs, and that there is an understanding that health care, regardless of how comprehensive, continuous, and high quality it is, could only account for a fraction of full health and well-being if we don't address at the same time the broader determinants of health through multi-sectoral policy and action. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Now, here we have tried to put together how we see primary health care is and what it is not. Actually, if you look at on the left-hand side of the slide, you will see at the top uh, uh, three uh, rows, that is the definition adopted by the, the World Health Organization with which we are in total agreement. We also try to define our own primary health care while changing it a bit and making sure that it also includes the social service delivery platform as it applies to healthcare. Because as you would need, especially with aging population, a lot of people are, will be receiving health care in their homes where it is difficult to uh, draw a line between what is health care, what is social care. I think that is important to mention here as the world is aging very rapidly. But what is more important maybe in, on this slide is that we all agree on what the primary health care is not. We don't mean by primary health care, rudimentary health care. We don't mean by, by basic care which is not something that we have to have a gatekeeping on with a very limited uh, 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 scope of, of services. And it is not just primary care, it is often referred to, especially in North America, it is also public health. And we don't necessarily see these things as some people say they are complementary. They are very much part and parcel of the primary health care. So I think it is important to keep those in mind. Next slide, please. Now, next slide, please. Now let me talk about the, um, the, the four shifts that we think we will have to make for making the primary healthcare uh, walk the talk in a way. So we have defined four tensions, if I may use the term, you could see a continuum of care which may start with a sporadic, isolated, disjointed one visit by one person to a healthcare setting to episodes of illnesses that are taken care and over by a team of health professionals, right? So if this is a continuum of care, so to speak, then the first thing we have to keep in mind that what we mean by primary health care and how it could be better is if it moves away from sporadic care, a one, care, one visit, one encounter with healthcare professional to comprehensive and continuous care. Primary health care is a key platform for the achievement of UIC would need to have its own boundaries as to the scope, depth, and breadth of what would constitute primary health care services. And they need to be tailored to the specific needs of the empaneled population and community. It cannot be one size fits all. It needs to adjust and adapt to the health and health needs of the community it serves. Whether they are a group of migrant people, citizens of an urban squatter, and do so in a comprehensive and continuous manner. Second, PAC could not be a service point that is used by people at their discretion or at their whim because they need to refill a prescription or because the hospital is too far away or because they don't want to wait for the appointment with a specialist. PAC needs to be the locus and the center of all personalized I and mean, community care with patient or individual at the center. And the health and healthcare needs of whom would need to be coordinated by a PSC team in charge, be it a visit to the specialist eventually, as needed, of course, and a subsequent follow up after a visit to the specialist, and then sending a reminder maybe for a check in before refilling a prescription. So, this is the person centeredness, integratedness of the prim uh, primary health care. And the third, PSC could not be a service platform of a two tiered system whereby the better off would have access without any gatekeeping, I might add, to specialist services and hospitals, whereas the less wealthy or the less educated would be forced to use 
primary healthcare services with gatekeeping to avoid paying user charges or co-payments. PSC services would need to be for all, for they would need to be perceived as high quality care for all and be accountable for its performance and results. And finally, the key ingredients of a PSC service delivery platform, whether it is human resources, financial resources, hardware or software, would need to be nimbly designed, adjustable to the change and surging demand for some or all needs. This could be an outbreak of a zoonotic infection in the community, new settlements accommodating incoming migrant workers for the construction of a bridge, for, exa uh, for example, or a rapidly aging population with complex health and social care needs. That adaptability is a sine qua non from primary healthcare. Less, the floodgates will be opened and hospitals will be overwhelmed and everyone will be talking about the flattening the curve, so to speak, right? I think one epidemiologist said very brilliant once, the outbreaks are inevitable, but epidemics are optional. And the way to prevent epidemics is to have resilient public health enabled primary health care fit for purpose. With this, I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Dr. Hu Yu Wang. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Anissa. So, um, this part of the presentation covers uh, the fourth chapter of the report, if you are starting to read it, making it happen. In this chapter, we present evidence from many countries to show how these shifts can happen and are already happening in practice. It focuses on three priority agendas, as you can see on the right side of the slide. So first one on the top, changing organization of PHC services by establishing a multidisciplinary team and assigning a defined population, often referred as impanelment. Second, on the bottom left, changes in health workforce education and policies to support team-based organization. Third, on the bottom right, changes in PHC financing, including resource mobilization, financial incentives, and accountability. So the arrows are used to symbolize the link between these shifts and the reforms. I'm going to cover a combination of four shifts and the three reforms very quickly. So I'll try to be succinct and I hope you can read more details in the report. Next slide, please. Shifting to quality, comprehensive care for all. Next. So starting with the team-based model, Team-based model for in-panel population offers what's required to provide comprehensive care for a population with various needs. For example, it provides additional human resource. It provides also more robust mix of skills, stronger mandate for a defined population, multiple modalities for service delivery from facilities to communities as well as efficiency in operation and quality assurance. Team members, by definition, are a mix of different cadres and professions. They have clear roles and responsibilities and collaborate with each other. Often in low and middle income countries, doctors, nurses, and community healthcare workers, there is a minimum core members, but the specific compensation really depends on country context and the local health needs. In the report, we have examples on how this has been done around the world. In Turkey, for example, the team also includes social workers, dietitian, psychologists. Next slide, please. This transition to a team-based model requires a paradigm shift in medical education, particularly for physicians. In the report, we also discussed the interventions about exposing medical students to the community-based clinical setting early in their education, providing incentives for them to choose primary care as their focus, and incubating, changing the culture for PHC providers to gain more professional respect. Many countries face shortage in PHC workforce already. Team-based model allows for more efficient use of existing workforce. 
For example, task shifting that can be easily done within a team structure have been widely used with evidence showing that non-physician health workers can effectively deliver a range of services from child maternal health, TB, HIV, to chronic disease screening. Bangladesh provides good example in this aspect. Next slide, please. On the financing side, high quality comprehensive PHC requires significant investment, both for upfront investment like infrastructure, HR training, and also for routine operations like utility, salary, and commodities. Several countries like Brazil, Ethiopia, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, and Ukraine, to name have all recently increased the funding for primary health care, accompanied by supply-side improvements. To estimate how much it's going to be, each country must identify its own service package, then assess. This service package needs to be explicit, customized to local needs, citizens' values and preferences, and take into consideration local resource constraints. It should be financed by government revenues, given these investments, like Amanda said in the opening remark, would pay large dividends and improve equity as well, as we present later. Donors can also play a critical role, focusing more on system strengthening, investing in surveillance and public health functions that have been underinvested in many countries, and aligns their resource behind government reforms. So now let's move to the next shift. Next slide, please. So from fragmentation to person-centered integration, when it comes to this, empanelment for a PHC team provides a strong foundation for care planning, coordination, and continuity. More likely, information and care will be organized around the people instead of around the providers. A long-lasting and trusty relationship can be established between the defined population and the teams. In Brazil, stronger PHC makes more people have a euro source of care, especially in the poor areas. In the team-based model, PHC teams act as like traffic dispatchers. They try each patient, support them to navigate through the rest of the system, and come back to PHC and the communities. This way, Patients don't need to coordinate care by themselves, for themselves, both within and outside PHC. Physical collocation with other providers, integrated IT systems, as well as communication and management tools will help PHC teams to perform this role. Next slide, please. Serving a defined population with life course approach requires competencies and skills not necessarily taught in traditional medical classrooms. So many of these skills, they go beyond clinical skills. For example, how to evaluate local health needs, how to stratify population by risks, how do you build trust with communities and various key stakeholders, and how to communicate and reach consensus on your strategic vision and new ways of working. So two sets of skills are cross-cutting here, how to use and interpret the data and the soft skills like leadership, communication, and relationship building. This again requires reorientation in education and training. Interprofessional education can bring different professions together early on in their education. Traditional curriculum needs to be changed to reflect the demand for all these additional skills. In Belgium, for example, community diagnosis exercise is offered as part of the curriculum so the students can learn how to better understand the needs of the communities. Very important here is also changing the mindset. Rather than acting as authorities, PHC providers are more of partners and facilitators working together with patients. The system should reward the behaviors that address patients' needs, such as managing complexity, solving problems, and thinking creatively. 
Next slide, please. Again, on the financing side, aligning provider payment mechanisms with the team-based integrated person-centered vision will be critical. For example, it needs to take into consideration health outcomes and the patient experiences in the payment, holding teams accountable, and incentivizing teamwork and preventive services. Some mechanisms that directly provide incentives for certain aspects, such as pay for coordination, that was firstly used in France, and some mechanisms indirectly incentivize, such as population-based payment, shared saving approach used in the United States, bundled payment used in Netherlands. Remember, likely none of these existing mechanisms by itself can meet all the expectations. As of 2016, 25 out of 34 OECD countries use some form of blending for PHC payment. Some low and middle income countries go in that direction as well, like Kazakhstan and Myanmar. Next slide, please. Shifting from inequity to fairness and accountability. Ennis has said, fairness is important, accountability is critical. Inequity will always be there and likely get worse if PHC providers only sit in facilities taking care of those who seek care. Team-based model has the capacity to extend care into the community, they educate the people and they identify problems early on and support home-based care. There are good examples from Costa Rica and Ethiopia on how they use PHC teams to engage communities. Next slide, please. PHC workforce also need to be distributed more evenly to improve equity because you all know that they are concentrated in rich areas, rich countries. In the report, we discussed how to use deployment and the compensation policies to mandate or encourage professionals serving in marginalized areas. Community engaged medical education program was also discussed where local students were recruited and prepared to practice in surrounding areas after their graduation. In the Philippines, 17 years after they started such a program, 80% of its graduates were still practicing in the same region. Also, regulatory reform can enable telehealth potentials and make it a tool to improve access in remote areas. Next slide, please. On the population side, access barriers need to be removed to ensure equity. There is consensus that PHC should be free at the point of care to develop targeted interventions and allocate resources accordingly. PHC teams need to better understand why people are not using PHC and communities should be empowered to be part of the process. The empowerment creates a natural structure for accountability. PHC teams need to be accountable for the experience and the health outcomes of the entire population, not just those who seek care. Their performance can be benchmarked with peers, shared through public reporting mechanisms, and linked with financial compensation from budget allocation or payment by purchases. Next slide, please. Last but not least, every one of us has been experiencing this. Resilience. Next, please. Through the COVID pandemic, there were country experiences and the reflections on how integrated team-based PHC platforms can contribute to preparedness, response, and resilience. They can and should perform functions like syndromic surveillance, and the close coordination with national public health authorities. Vietnam, for example, has relied on PHC for surveillance and contact tracing. The trusted relationship we mentioned earlier can enable effective communication and behavioral changes. Experience from Liberia for Ebola can speak to this, and the trusted relationship will be critical for the vaccination hesitance issue that many countries are facing now. Needless to say, 
the approach is better equipped to maintain essential health services during crisis and prevent the system being overwhelmed by the crisis. Next slide, please. I will be talking about the human resource and the financing perspectives together, as there are uh, quite big similarities. From both perspectives, policy making need to be agile and flexible. Training, financing, social and practical support like psychology support, childcare, they need to reach frontline workers rapidly. Health workforce need to acquire skills for coping with emergencies in communities through their training. And people need to be able to access new services and the benefits quickly, like testing, vaccination. Countries across the world, I cannot name a single because there are so many, have been taking actions in these areas. And many of these experiences were documented in our report. The key is, after COVID-19, how we embed these features into the system for better preparedness and resilience. So with this, I'm gonna pass this to my colleague from Zhao for the next part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will be very short. I have four slides, uh, which really highlight chapter five of the report. Um, after Ennis and Hui Hui talk about what and how, I think it's important to talk about implementation and what's next, uh, so we can work the talk. Um, we try our best um, to make our recommendations in chapter five um, to be very specific and concrete and action oriented. Um, so it's highlight the recommendation actions um, for countries, partners um, to take on, uh, to move forward the reform and how also touch on how the bank can help. Um, let me move to the next slide, please. So we know for any reform to take place, um, it's important to have a set of, we call pre practical prerequisites um, to be in place. Uh, otherwise, we only talk about reforms on paper and uh, not in real situation. Um, we know reform um, go beyond technical justifications. It requires political leadership. Um, so for PHC reform, uh, with no exception, a uh, strong country and international and community level uh, leadership is really required. It's not only Minister of Health who will take on this initiative, it's the whole government, including Minister of Finance and other key stakeholders to move forward this, this agenda, to make it su successful. The second thing is for any reform to be successful, um, it require pre uh, 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 upfront investment. Um, as Mamtar mentioned, PHC has been a best buy uh, in, in, in health. Investing in PHC, you have a great return. But to make the reform happen, it's, it's required financing upfront. So have the readiness and will, willingness to invest is critical. And also for any reform to be meaningful, have an accountability mechanism and, and have a successful metrics to really clarify what's the outcome of the report are also critical. So all those three factors are critical to avoid this uh, PHC reform to be uh, just a reform on paper, not in reality. So what does that mean for countries, for uh, international partners and for the bank? Um, I'll just highlight some key messages in the next three slides. Next slide, please. So for countries, I think it's important as highlighted by Anis and, um, and Hui Hui, the three key areas need to, be, uh, need to be the priority areas to look, to think through the reform measures. Uh, service delivery, health workforce and financing, those are critical lever for the reform to be successful. Just quickly, in the area of service delivery, we have learned for PHC to be effective, it's not, for PHC to provide service in a clinical setting. The advantage of PHC is really to build the community collection and build the trust with the community and the through outreach and a com communication arrangement. Um, we know in COVID, 
PHC has played a key role to communicate about the risks, um, to work with the community, and to deliver services through the community network. And also we have learned during COVID, a digital platform, innovations, uh, has been really critical in pushing service through during crisis and have a data system which can really be the backbone of the service delivery is critical. For health workforce, uh, any reform, you need people to implement it. Have healthcare professionals on board is critical part of the success of a reform. So develop and implement a multi a multi-branched, multidisciplinary set of medical education reform is critical to implement this um, recommended uh, community-focused and team-based care reform. And also we need to create the right incentive for, for health professionals. So in, there's a lot of innovation in this regard has been highlighted in, in chapter five. I'll, I'll re-invite you to look, look deeper. And finally, financing is, is critical to ensure uh, the, uh, the reform to, to get a good start and also to uh, create an investment framework um, in terms of financing those key packages of services, um, um, which will be critical part of the reform. The bottom line is for PHC as a public good, it should be provided free of charge as point of service. Next slide. So for international donors and the international community and, and partners, uh, we highlight a few key recommendations. Um, we highlight four of here. I don't want to repeat, but more, more or less touch on um, provide learning, uh, knowledge sharing, um, support the education reform so we can have new generation of healthcare professionals to take on this, support the multidisciplinary uh, reform both on the care side and on the medical education side, and also foster innovation technology and a new initiative through financial support and partnership. So those are critical support the international community can provide. Next one. Lastly, for the bank, um, we can support through our key instruments, which can be summarized as our lending, learning, and policy policy dialogue to support country level leadership. For our learning in the, in the next years to come, as Marmata mentioned, we already have um, a financing platform uh, to support COVID. We have reached many countries which we didn't have health operation before. So that's a platform we can build on to support um, PHC reform. In addition to that, we also have our regular lending program, um, which can support innovations. There's a several countries PHC project has taken off, provide a lot of learning for us and for global community. And working with GFF is another angle we can move this agenda forward. In terms of learning, um, I'm glad to announce uh, through our PHCPF um, initiative, we are launching a knowledge hub or resource hub for PHC. It will start as an internal instrument but gradually we're looking to uh, make it a public good. And also our joint learning network has been facilitating peer-to-peer um, -peer learning. We will strengthen that part. Uh, through COVID, we also organized many events, um, hundreds of them in the past year, over 11,000 participants um, had joined the, the knowledge events. So we'll continue to build on those, uh, strengthen the learning part. And lastly, um, the leadership at the country uh, through the bank support and policy dialogue and analytical work, particularly in facilitated Ministry of Health and Ministry of Finance collaboration is another critical part we want to support. We have the flagship global flagship uh, program, uh, global flagship learning course, which normally we have both participants from Ministry of Finance, parliamentary, parliamentarians and Ministry of Health. We'll continue to build on that learning platform uh, to facilitate um, policy dialogue and build country level leadership. So that's a contribution we can make through uh, the bank system. Let me stop here. I really invite everybody to look deep 
uh, into the report, like Mamtar, I plan to read it during the summer break, so I will refresh my memory, um, and so we can better follow up. Over to you, Mohammed. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Frank. I think this is uh, very good, and we now have an excellent panel of internal and external discussants. We'll have a few minutes each to reflect on what has been presented of the report. You have the bios of the panelists, but I would just highlight uh, Junaid Ahmed is the country director for the World Bank in India, which is, as you can all imagine, is one of the most important uh, client countries for the bank. And Junaid has led the bank's effort through the COVID-19 crisis as we also begin to think of what comes uh, next. And then I'll go to Dr. Suraya Dalil, who is the director of special program on primary healthcare at the WHO. Dr. Dalil was the Minister of Health in Afghanistan uh, before becoming the Director of the Special Program on Primary Health Care. And then Dr. Munir Eshetu, who is a Special Advisor to the Minister of Health of Ethiopia, will come next, followed by Dr. Pauline Basinga, who is Director at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that has been a key partner for us uh, in terms of the uh, uh, discussions. And then finally, at the end, have but not lastly, uh, Dina Ringold, who is the Regional Director for Human Development in the Africa region of the World Bank. So I'll go in that order. And Junaid, if I can ask, uh, what's your reflection on the basis of the report that you have heard uh, from uh, the colleagues that have shared it? Over to you, Junaid. Mohammed, you don't, you don't want to start off by asking our Dr. Suraya, our guest, to start off. I, I think... Um, why don't you say a few, <laughs> All right, have a discussion. I'd I would. like to hear uh, from you and then from Dr. Nuli. Yeah. With pleasure. First of all, uh, wonderful to be with all of you and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, I think this emphasis on reimagining uh, uh, primary health care is really welcome. Uh, and it's really welcome for exactly the reasons uh, that are laid out in the uh, uh, in the document from the fact that uh, we need to rethink uh, public health, the fact that there are technological shifts that are happening. Uh, it is a, it is a, 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 real, uh, a real changing uh, storyline and therefore we do need to reimagine. So very much welcome, uh, welcome this report. I also very much like the way you, the report has approached how. Uh, it's not prescriptive. It doesn't say here are the five things to do, it offers principles and says these principles should guide the dialogue in nations because the political economy of nations will drive how to take this forward. And I think it's extremely important uh, that this report uh, uh, really focused on the principles uh, around the how rather than uh, being prescriptive. I remember being part of the World Development Report 2004, making services uh, work for the poor and uh, what we did was we created a framework of accountability on which to judge service delivery. And when we presented it, internal to the bank, there was a demand for prescription. External to the bank, there was a welcome that it offered a framework for nations to actually do their own diagnostics and figure out their own political path on how accountability in service delivery would be, would be uh, uh, implemented. So I really like the fact that you have stayed away from prescriptions and focused more on, on the principles uh, and welcome. And it takes, uh, it takes a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of strength in our institution to remain on, on track with that rather than give the three uh, prescriptive, uh, uh, prescriptive uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, lessons. Um, having said that, I asked myself after uh, reading the report and listening to the presentation, primary health is not something new. Primary health has its genesis in history. It has its genesis in non-state uh, actors. And so the question I asked, even though you asked it and you answered it, answered it is why are we having to reimagine uh, primary health? And I think the one part that I would have liked to see more emphasis on is states are not easily easily adapting to situations. States don't adapt as quickly. Uh, and I think that the future of public health and the future of the whole framework around primary health will depend on what kind of 
reform process and what kind of state capability do we see in different states? Because if states are not able to take forward this reform process, what you've laid down as principles and the importance is not going to, uh, not going to deliver uh, what we want. I think we need to understand what does it take for a state to rethink uh, its, uh, its structures and its relationship to, uh, uh, to the health system. I'll give you an example. In India, it became very clear that uh, public health at the third tier of government, the local government, was something that has been underinvested. That today, panchayat governments, rural governments, as well as urban local governments are not strong third tiers. And as they're not strong third tiers, it's very hard to see them deliver, uh, deliver public health. And so to reimagine public uh, pri primary health, you have to reimagine the third tier of government. It's this linkage between the state, state capability and incentives within the state and its relation to the health sector. That is something that I think we need to invest more. The second example I'd give you is India has Anganwadi workers, Asha workers. These are the frontline workers that you're talking about that can form the basis of a primary health. However, we don't quite know what is the future of, uh, of these workers. Will they become state workers? Will they become contracted workers? But contracted by whom? A local government, center government, state government, or will they be part of non-state actors? So how you actually link this public, how do you actually link public reforms into these primary health workers, I think is going to be important. The best way I can, uh, I, can uh, I think, describe uh, what I'm saying about the relationship between the state and the health system for reimagining PHC is it's time for schools of public policy to meet schools of public health, or rather schools of public health to meet schools of public policy, to keep them separate is to ignore the fact that reform of the health system requires deep reform of the public administrative system. And that's the how that I think we need to uh, assess quite a bit and, and focus on as an institution uh, in our dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Junaid. I think those are very uh, pertinent uh, comments, very helpful comments. And I will now ask uh, Dr. Suraya Jalil uh, to uh, come in and uh, provide your own perspective, Dr. Dalil, both as a former minister, but also in your role now at WHO. Over to you, Dr. Dalil. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fatih. Uh, Vice President Montamorti, distinguished panelists, um, dear moderator, Dr. Ali, um, colleagues and friends. It's my pleasure to be here today for the launching of the World Bank's flagship report on reimagining primary health care during and after COVID-19. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Mohammed Ali Fateh for his leadership in producing this valuable report. And thank you for inviting me to speak today. We are all keenly aware that our collective global challenge as partners is to end the current pandemic and to ensure an equitable and resilient recovery towards UHC and the health-related SDGs. This report, Walking the Talk, rightly communicates that a robust and reimagined primary health care agenda must be part of the post-COVID recovery efforts and should include reforms along the lines of the recommendations to make the health system efficient, effective, and equitable, and as you said in the report, to make it fit for purpose. The recommendations emanated from this report, together with the World Bank's comparative advantages, as you said, on lending, learning, and policy dialogue at the highest government levels across the sectors, place the bank in a privileged position to contribute to the global and national efforts of renewing primary health care and delivering on its promise of contributing to health for all everywhere. 
As to our partner, we in WHO are committed to supporting this work and complementing your efforts with our own. As Mr. Kamal Ahmed described, primary healthcare is not a new topic or a new idea, but the opportunity for it to try and make a lasting impact is new. The current pandemic reminded us to go back to the fundamentals, to public health, to community participation and empowerment, and to health and well-being as a fundament of human rights. It reminded us to focus on people's needs and preferences along the continuum, from health promotion and disease prevention, to treatment, rehabilitation, and palliative care as close as feasible to people's everyday environment. The pandemic profoundly reminded us of the importance of primary health care, the essential public health function, the integrated services and community participation and empowerment. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, December last year, WHO launched a special program on primary health care. The program offers an agile and integrated platform that connects the organization's three levels. It means headquarters, regional and country offices, as well as the three billion strategic priorities, enhancing technical coherence and synergies to advance primary health care. The program and its functions includes country tailored support that's built on the UHC partnership, as well as producing evidence and amplifying innovations and promoting policy and multilateral partnerships grounding in primary health care. In the special program on primary health care, a number of initiatives are underway building on the PhD operational framework that was endorsed last November is the monitoring and evaluation framework that will be published in September, a new capacity building program on leading primary health care through WHO Academy and emerging work on implementation solutions, to name a few. And as you said earlier, a global report towards the end of next year is coming. COVID-19 has shown us that multi-sectoral partnerships and multilateralism are key for strengthening country leader force to combat the pandemic, maintain essential health services, and contribute in an equitable recovery. We must use this opportunity to strengthen our existing ties in a time when the world needs it the most. Over the last year, as the co-lead of the PhD Accelerator alongside UNICEF of the Global Action Plan for Healthy Lives and Well-Being for All, we have learned firsthand that we are stronger together. The Global Action Plan, which includes WHO, the World Bank, and 11 other agencies is helping to align the support around country leadership through the PHC Accelerator by ensuring health is sustainably financed, communities are engaged, multi-sectoral determinants are being addressed, gender equality is enhanced, data is available and used, and innovation is leveraged, including in fragile settings. Please, Mr. Moderator, let me end up by reaffirming WHO's commitment to strengthen collaboration with the World Bank, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with UNICEF and other partners, as well as with the member states in our collective journey for primary health care to enable the attainment of universal health coverage and health-related development goals, health security, and most importantly, leaving no one behind. Thank you very much for having me here, and I look forward to the deliberations. I will make sure that I have this report in my suitcase for summer holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalil. I, I think it was a uh, great comment. I think the Global Action Plan is included. It's really central to the how we work together 
collaboratively under the PHC accelerator to take this forward. So thank you for bringing that up. And I believe that uh, readers of the report will also find the references to that in the report very useful in terms of how we organize to do this uh, forward. So I will now go to Dr. Munir Eshetu, who is a senior technical advisor to the Minister of Health of Ethiopia. Dr. Munir, over to you. Your reactions to what you have heard on the report. Thank you, Mohammed, and uh, it's a privilege to be uh, speaking on this event. And uh, I have uh, scanned the document and I found it uh, very good. For, but for our country, it is uh, it cannot be timely than this because we are now engaged on reforming our primary health care. And so it would be a very good policy tool for us to consider some of the important improvements. So uh, I will not be taking this to a summer reading, but I will be taking it to our next policy dialogue and looking at which of the recommendations we can incorporate in our journey. And as you all know, Ethiopia is uh, in East Africa. We have about 110 million population low-income countries, so primary health care is, uh, is, is not an option for us to disregard. So we have been highly invested in primary health care and with our uh, flagship community health extension workers. And using that primary health care, we have improved massively uh, important areas of infectious disease and reproductive and maternal health care. But what that success has done to the primary health care is that uh, it, it prevented important areas of improvements that we should have incorporated along the way. And But now there is a, a wider recognition in the ministry and uh, in our system that we need to reform primary health care. And this year we have launched our five-year health system, health sector transformation plan, which clearly uh, mentions how and what the primary health care is and how we can reform that. So this is a very good reform and we have identified those challenges mentioned in, in, this, uh, in this paper as why we needed to, ref to reform the primary health care, mainly uh, the demand for higher quality by the population and whereby primary health care did not meet their, their respect, dignity, or they did not have trust and they were bypassing these services or these services are already there, but they don't utilize this care. And also uh, the changing demography as mentioned in this and the urbanization and so on. And besides also COVID, even before COVID we were thinking about reforming our primary health care, but COVID has made it absolutely clear that we need to reform primary health care for many reasons. And uh, I would not go to that, but our health sector transformation identified five areas of improving primary health care. Uh, which are somehow aligned to this uh, report. This included in our session some of the things that may not be here in this report is improving the leadership and governance of our district health system and also including the ministry so, you, so that you know they would be able to do this adaptive steering and uh, you know changing uh, frequently upon demand and uh, accountability and improving data use but also uh, producing healthcare providers that are competent and compassionate and also motivated. A huge problem with COVID, with burnout, but also motivating healthcare workers has been a challenge in our health system. And, and also there is now a political commitment in investing in primary healthcare system and uh, changing the donor, so the health system financing into sustainable, whereby the proportion of the government's health expenditure increases and we will be using innovative tax, uh, innovative methods to raise financing. But so all these would be accompanied by better measurement. And uh, this better measurement is, I think, a very important part because you need to measure uh, important areas to see how this transformation is changing and what results you are seeing. And then, so you should be able to change frequently based on your improvement. And uh, so I generally say this is a very good report coming at a very good time for us. And we are very happy to work with World Bank and uh, in implementing some of these recommendations into our health, health sector transformation plan. And uh, also would be looking forward for any resources that we can leverage to address this improvement. 
But one also another area that really I would be happy if World Bank also, or, and this group should also consider that countries can learn from each other. They can measure their primary health care together, and then they can go on a journey of improvement together, especially uh, measure, measuring uh, patient satisfaction at the population level and their trust and their utilization can be measured across countries at the same time using somehow similar tools. And then they can also try to improve uh, uh, this uh, primary health care so that they can learn from each other. And I, I hope this learning would be would be important for all, for all of them and brings about also transparency. Saying this, thank you very much for a very good uh, uh, report and I hope we'll be using this as we go forward. Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Monero. So I'll now go to uh, Dr. Pauline Basinga, who is a director uh, for health in Africa, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Pauline, uh, what are your reflections? You've been a key partner uh, to all of us in, the, uh, in this space, WHO, UNICEF, the bank, GFF. Uh, so from the foundation's perspective, what are your reflections on the basis of what you've heard so far on the report? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pate. And I would like just to make five quick points. The first one is really to congratulate the bank um, HNP team for, for this excellent report. The report uh, really provides, you know, bold reforms and it's, uh, I, you know, I was planning to only read the executive summary before, but after reading the executive summary, I was tempted to go and read the report. I went through all of it and I just scanned through the, you know, 40 pages of uh, comprehensive references of all key uh, publication about uh, uh, primary health care that, uh, that is out there. You've done really an amazing job, uh, not only, you know, approaching this as a World Bank report, but really looking at uh, producing a public good uh, for, for the world. Uh, and then also at the end, really coming up with some concrete recommendation on how the bank can, can, um, can you know, take those from forward. The, the second point I'll make uh, is that from the beginning of our support for, for this work, we have been stressing the importance of having this PHC flagship report as the new direction for the World Bank health engagement across the regions and, and also an important pillar for its human capital agenda. Uh, rather than just a report, uh, you know, from the uh, you know HNP team in in DC, so we are really excited to see that this is exactly how you know this uh, report is uh, trying to to achieve. It has been uh, it's clear that it's owned by the regional team, and also great to see that other bank efforts uh, around primary healthcare, are, you know, have been uh, really leveraged, like PFCPI and GLN, etc. The proposed reform uh, that uh, proposed here are quite well thought through. Uh, but one will need to work on all those three reforms almost at the same time, redesigning, you know, service delivery, uh, reimagining, you know, health workforce reforms and also financing at the same time as the system continue to deliver. So this will take a lot of collaboration, both at the global level and also at the country level. I think the bank uh, multi-phased approach uh, will fit very well with this vision because you have the ability as the biggest fund of primary health care to uh, think long term, like 10 to 15 years. And also you have the way that you can uh, think about how to restructure your task team so that they can work with country offices and also bring together different donors at the country level because the bank has that convening power to really bring the global fund and USAID and others together as you engage with ministries of finance, minister of health. Uh, the bank is the probably one of the rare organizations that has that ability to work across uh, the government. If there is a way at the country level uh, for a one uh, you know, donor engagement with the government to drive those agenda, I think that would be important. And the third point I'd like to make is from the foundation side, as uh, our teams have been working very closely with, uh, you know, the bank uh, HNP team to operationalize this, we've provided the trust funds uh, for the bank to start thinking about how to launch the, implement, the actual implementation of this reform in few countries. You know, developing country-specific policy options through dialogue with government and, and as uh, you prepare the, the IDA project uh, coming up. It will be really exciting to see that process and uh, we will be uh, open to continue to, to engage with you as you select the countries and, and, and working together to actually, you know, seeing those, uh, those programs in, in, in move. 
my, my fourth point is around measure. So uh, it was really great to see that uh, the PLCPI uh, is going to put in place a learning mechanism. The bank has been really good in, uh, you know, coupling implementation of program with very sound evaluation and learning. I think it would be really good to do some very good learning here to measure progress of the shift, because without that, it will be very difficult for other countries because country will be moving in different pace, uh, you know, depending on uh, their, their reality, et cetera. So if there are some front runner countries that will try to move those reforms, measuring those, and then try to share uh, as best practices, I think that would really help uh, in a big way. And the last point I would like to make is uh, about to highlight the importance of the fourth shift in the report that you've talked about, the shift from fragility to resilience. COVID-19 painfully told us how, you know, we are not prepared for the pandemic and funding, you know, for preparedness was grossly inadequate, even though uh, the bank has really stepped up uh, and, 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 and really, um, uh, you know, did amazing work to, to, to address this. But now in addressing the financing gap for preparedness, the role of the bank will be so essential. Uh, the bank has uh, this unique uh, strength of channeling funds to governments uh, because the government has the ability to manage and build their system. I think it would be really essential that all the bank PHC project have an element of resilience building in it, including things like uh, surveillance capacity in the PHC team, you know, multidisciplinary team with infectious disease control capabilities, strengthening na National Public Health Institute uh, so that we have well-trained epidemiologists in countries, but also uh, other, uh, you know, uh, people who are able to manage EOCs, et cetera. Uh, I think it will be really good to see uh, the back take uh, more leadership on this, and we will be happy to continue conversation with you on that. I will stop here and also really congratulate you and, and all for, for this uh, uh, historic, you know, high quality report that you put together. And I hope that, uh, you know, people will read it. And also, uh, as my colleague from Ethiopia say, the most important is if people who are sitting in technical working group within countries can, you know, take this as principles and then adapt and, and, and you know, from countries, the more we see a request coming up to the global level, the more we can see these shifts, you know, happening in different way, but adapted to country realities. Thank you very much for the partnership with the, the Gate Foundation. Thank you, uh, Palan. And uh, thank you for those uh, comments. I think your five points are excellent and we'll, we'll take them on uh, in terms of where we go from here with the report. Now, let me ask uh, then Dina Ringold, uh, who is the Regional Director for Human Development in the Africa region, to give us uh, your reflection uh, from the Africa region human development perspective. I think Pauline mentioned the centrality of primary healthcare in terms of human capital accumulation. Maybe you can give us your re reactions uh, to what you've heard so far. Over to you, Dina. Thank you so much, and, and thanks for the invitation to be part of this uh, really important launch. And I really want to congratulate um, Hui Hui Feng and, his, and the, the whole team that um, uh, put the report together, and, and Mohammed for your um, leadership on this uh, agenda. I think it's, uh, it's going to be an important um, springboard for our uh, next steps um, in health. Um, so actually, I also want to thank my fellow panelists because I think you've you've made some um, great points, and it's exciting to see how, um, uh, it, it, from your different roles, you're already sort of thinking about how we take this forward. And and I was reflecting, at, listening to Paul, and that um, the last trip I made before the world shut down was um, with Fang and Mohammed to the Gates Foundation. And we were discussing the early steps of this report and the links with human capital. And I don't think we, well, I certainly didn't uh, um, have a sense of what was coming and, and how actually uh, uh, critical th this this agenda would become. So, so I'll just, I have sort of three buckets of, of reflections. The first is that I think this, this could not be more timely and, and relevant. Um, so in my role, I cover um, West and Central Africa. And these are countries with the, uh, some of the countries with the lowest human capital index in the world and high levels of um, preventable child and, and adult mortality, including um, maternal mortality and then high fertility rates and a demographic profile 
um, that is really putting primary health care under, under strain. Um, and these are also countries that are um, particularly uh, in the line of fire of, of, of climate change and, and increasing vector-borne diseases. So, um, so even without COVID, uh, the, these uh, health systems were, were under strain. And um, one of the really critical tools that we've had to measure capacity um, has been the service delivery indicators initiative. And, and that shows, um, and this is again, pre-COVID, that um, less than half of, of health providers, as we're looking at Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, um, could diagnose uh, in, in a simulated case environment basic health conditions um, like diarrhea. Um, so, so we know that there's a lot, uh, a lot that needs to be done, and then COVID hits, and this has really exacerbated both health outcomes and the strain on health services. Um, so, uh, Nigeria, and um, I'm always afraid to talk about uh, Nigeria in the presence of Mohammed, but um, it, the numbers that I've seen suggest that um, outpatient visits, um, antenatal care uh, services, and immunization have declined. Uh, up to 50%, and, and we have a GFF estimate that suggests that um, maternal mortality uh, a, a year after the crisis um, uh, will be um, up uh, 9%. So, so the, I think the case is made for, for primary health care um, and, the, um, uh, and the urgency of this agenda. I think a second set of reflections are that um, that the COVID pandemic has really made us feel the absence uh, and, the, and the vacuum uh, of uh, not having a strong primary health care system. And um, just to take two examples, one is, um, you know, in the current quest to roll out vaccines um, uh, and the, the high level of vaccine hesitancy in, in Africa West. I mean, people are getting their information from social media when they should be getting it from their um, primary health care care providers. So not having that trusted voice, those people in the community, um, that sort of outreach um, uh, is really setting, uh, setting this back. Um, uh, and we know the consequences. I think the second is uh, the second sort of area is that I think we've struggled to really measure and, and understand um, the impact of the COVID crisis. Um, I quoted some numbers, but I think without having uh, strong and robust primary health care systems. We just don't have the um, infrastructure in place for um, for measurement, and and I think that's uh, that's the point that others have made um, that that is critical. So so then if I think about you know the the going back to the title of of how we walk the talk and and um, you know in my role uh, this is the the critical question is how do we operationalize how do we bring this into country programs and I think that this report really challenges us to think about how we can develop steps forward at the country level. And we heard a little bit about how Ethiopia is thinking about this, but I think this is something we need to systematically uh, think about in each uh, country program um, so that we have a clear and re realistic agenda um, for re reform and that we think about you know, what this means in, in particular uh, a particular context and how it's a starting point for um, uh, for uh, country country based work and 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 that leads me to my third area of reflections and and um, and that's um, that uh, you know we have uh, particular areas where I think we need more and further thought and and one of them comes from the fact that the region I cover. Uh, half the countries are um, fragile and com conflict affected. And I think we really need to um, parse what the implications are uh, for the um, for the conflict affected regions. And, and I think in Africa, there's some emerging examples and thinking about, you know, how you you can provide frontline primary health care um, workers with resources more directly so that they can access the supplies and, and, and materials that they need. Um, integration and, and uh, innovative partnerships with non-state providers, use of technology. I think these are all things that we need to look at uh, existing um, uh, initiatives and, and draw lessons. And then um, the second is around, um, I think, a point that, that Feng uh, emphasized, which is the 
sort of um, community uh, based uh, um, uh, approaches and and the um, um, and I think it relates to my point earlier on the, the social contract. So, so again, going to the countries that I cover, we have a great example of the Sahel Women's Empowerment Program, the SWED uh, program in, in the five Sahel countries, where um, it's really a multi-sectoral approach working with community leaders to roll out access to um, uh, basic re reproductive health uh, and, and maternal uh, and child health services. And I think what that um, example shows is the power of you know, both the community, um, but also uh, uh, working uh, with uh, women um, as agents uh, and, and also with local uh, leaders, such as religious leaders. So I think that's another area where we could think about more. And then the last reflection is just the, um, uh, the challenge we have around the health uh, with health workers, and a, a lot of excellent points have been made. I've been struck over the years that this is a this is a hard uh, area to crack. Um, we've had various attempts um, to think through uh, incentive frameworks um, for health providers, um, and and I think it's it's an area where where we really need um, to redouble our efforts. Um, and it's it's again one that requires the collaboration. Of um, if I'm thinking about you know the, the the teams within the bank, thinking about education and skills, um, thinking about um, uh, the the um, public sector incentives, uh, financing, governance arrangements, and so forth. So so um, it's quite a huge agenda. But I think this report uh, gives us uh, a new uh, uh, energy uh, to take it on. And so um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this can help us uh, move forward uh, and pass the current pandemic and beyond. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dina. I think we uh, have heard really excellent reflections from all our panelists. There has also been a very active live chat that has been going ongoing. So we've got eight, nine minutes uh, before the uh, end of this uh, lunch event. I'll ask um, a few of our panelists to answer some of the questions that have come through. Uh, perhaps let me ask uh, Dr. Dalil first, and then uh, Junaid, I'll come to you before I go to Pauline. Uh, Dr. Dalil, uh, given sort of your previous role and uh, where you are today at WHO, as Minister of Health, what would you, how would you advise a minister to take the elements of this reimagining, let's say tomorrow or next week? Uh, how do you uh, sequence that? Give us a bit of your reflection and then I'll call to Junaid. So over to you. Thank you. First of all, I understand the, the incredible role that the World Bank plays at the country level. I have seen it in my own work. In Afghanistan, um, you have a comparative advantage alongside a number of other partners, including WHO, to influence um, narrative in, in, in each capital. Um, one of the speakers said that take the report and, and, and debate on it at the country level and, and at the Ministry of Health and even beyond with the with, with few ministries and parliamentarian and the health commission, commission of the parliament, et cetera. And really um, uh, look at it from that lens and see, okay, what we need to do differently. Um, where are the, the shortcomings? We, we, the, the point is, we have a great opportunity to, to rethink the entire thing, rethink the primary health care, rethink the universal health coverage. And we need to, your report is guiding, guiding us, I'm putting myself in, in, in Kabul, and your report is guiding us to say, oh guys, you need to work with Ministry of Education, you need to work with Ministry of Higher Education, you need to look at the entire architecture of health workforce. You need to, you need to, to, to look at on how you measure primary health care. You need to look at how you measure those left behind and, and then what you need to do to, to reach them. 
Um, I think the multi-sectorality multi of it in terms of infrastructure, in terms of water and sanitation, in terms of um, connectivity and, and, and uh, um, information technology are so key to make progress in health. We often underestimate those, uh, those areas. The biggest influence that my work and my success or my failure as a minister had was coming from other ministries, from Ministry of Finance, from Ministry of um, Rural um, Development, from Ministry of Agriculture, from Ministry of Higher Education. It's not, in it, 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 Afghanistan, it's not Ministry of Health who was responsible for higher education and training medical, medical and, and public health personnel. So in a number of countries, it's a, it's a different portfolio. And I think you, you bring a very uh, renewed perspective into primary health care, very timely, following the declaration of Astana three years ago, following the um, 2019 publications and decision and so on. I think the, the, the work, the political leaders have made those decisions. There's enough declarations and political commitments to uphold primary health care. But it's really come down to action, to decision, to political will. It has to be sustained. It has to be explicit. And it has to, uh, it has to really um, get it done this time. And we, we have to do it this time. On the measurement part, as colleagues from Ethiopia uh, mentioned, and also another um, speakers highlighted that, in September this year, the monitoring and measurement guidance that includes a number of indicators, it has gone through a very robust technical consultation with regional offices of WHO. It includes core indicators that every country um, uh, will report, including those with um, paper-based information systems. And also it has additional indicators where advanced health systems with advanced and electronic information system will be able to, uh, to report on them. It's important to measure them. So we, 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 we agree on that point and we are on that page with you and we have taken concrete actions to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to help countries um, on that. Very good. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Dr. Daniel. And Junaid, I know we have just a few minutes left. Uh, there were questions, I think Keith Martin and, and other colleagues actually uh, asked, from your point of view as uh, the country director uh, for India, for instance, how, what would the bank do or how would the bank help its client countries strengthen the administrative capacities in not only the ministries of health, uh, but finance and other um, uh, ministries, given what you even said earlier, it's not only the, ministry, the schools of public health and schools of public policy, but in government and given the bank's central role in engaging multi-sectorally in governments. How, how, what, what, what are we going to do differently to improve um, the capabilities to be able to drive such important reforms as has been laid out uh, in this discussion. You are muted, tonight. Uh, yeah. So, so Mohammed, I think the word I would take away from your report is the whole of government approach. And I'll give you two quick examples. One is when Kerala was hit with uh, with floods, devastating floods. Kerala turned to us and said we don't want emergency support, disaster risk management support from the bank. We want the bank to help build state capacity to ensure that such events don't happen again. So what we have is a subnational DPL, which is working on strengthening finance, regulatory, and service delivery across several sectors. And it is a, a five to seven year program of investing in state capacity to build resilience. And that program is called Resilient Kerala. And we've just finished the second uh, 
uh, program of it within uh, within a matter of uh, uh, of one year. Another example is we're now doing in Chennai uh, a project which is Chennai Partnership. So instead of doing public uh, health uh, engagement in Chennai, uh, transport engagement in Chennai, and uh, 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 and the water engagement separately, what we have done is engaged with government uh, to look at Chennai government as a whole and how its systems affect public health, water, which is also part of public health, as Dr. Suraya correctly mentioned, as well as, uh, uh, as, well as uh, 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 transport, all of them together. This ability to dialogue with government, to look at government systems, investing in state capability and changing, changing if you will, the incentives within the state requires us to understand, in fact, we need to see through the eyes of the state. If we can see through the eyes of the state, we'll be better able to understand how to embed a systems change in public health going forward. One last point, uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, this reimagining uh, primary health, I think is phenomenal. I would invite the, uh, uh, the whole health uh, uh, family to give us a parallel reimagining public health period. I think today's opportunity to rethink public health of which primary health is a very important component, I think would strengthen our ability to work at a country level in a more, as you say, whole of government approach. Thank you very much, uh, Junaid. I think uh, this is very uh, useful, a very good uh, insight, and I think the team will continue to work in this direction. Uh, I know that we've run out of time, but I really would like to hear from uh, Pauline. What do entrepreneurs, what's the role of entrepreneurs? That's a question, if you can just quickly, in a minute or less, uh, how would an entrepreneur uh, come to play in this? The role of the state is important. You need a whole of government. It's multi-sectoral, but still in some countries, the private sector is an important player. So there's a question that you may want to respond to. And then, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pate. Yeah, you know, I will say COVID, um, the response to COVID has shown us the ingenuity and the, um, you know, uh, kind of like how the private sector, the entrepreneur have come together to kind of find solutions, right? I think it would be really important to bring them on board as government, the all government approach, including partners are thinking about reimagining primary health care. I think bringing the private sector along, uh, especially on as they think about uh, you know, how to leverage technology, uh, to think about how to train people differently, et cetera. I think that's really a very, you know, a role that the, the, uh, the private sector can play. You know, we've seen that they can really come up with some out of uh, you know, the box uh, ideas. And one thing which is really important is that COVID has shown how they all depend on public health. And, and they are very, very interested, I think, opening that opportunity to them to come and say, you know, help us think through this new way of doing business. I think it will be really very important. Thank you. I wish we could have a bit more time. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we've exceeded the time that we allotted for this by three minutes. I'm respectful of each of your time. Let me really thank uh, the panelists uh, for reacting at a very short notice to a very uh, large uh, report which has put quite a bit of material uh, to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dalil, and thank you, uh, Junaid, and thank you, Pauline, and Dina, and Dr. Monir. I know some, for some of you, it's already very late where you are. And I also would like to thank the team that drove this, uh, Ennis, uh, Hugh, Hugh uh, um, and, and, and Fung, as well as the wider team that helped put together this uh, report. And our Vice President, uh, Mamta Murthy, who uh, led in, in a way the overall HD engagement, including what we do in health and for her presence and her contribution in this launch of the report. And more to be uh, done ahead. I believe that uh, work is just started. Uh, so look forward to continuing to engage with all of you. Uh, thank you very much. I think we'll bring this to a close now that we've exhausted the time that we've allotted for this. Mohammed, thank you very much, everyone. Mohammed, one quick thing. Thank yes. you for your thank you for your leadership, uh, because it is your leadership that has helped us guide this whole discussion on public health over the last uh, uh, last uh, several years. So uh, while you thank many of us, we must not forget your role. It has been a very essential. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Junaid. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Thank you all this support. Uh, thank you, Muhammad. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks.